the clinic. We're joined tonight by people from the East Side Clinic. Uh, with the holidays upon us, it's harder to find Fridays. So Russ got hold of me and said, could we join up for the next two clinics? So we'll be a joint clinic tonight and December 15th also. So welcome to all our friends from the North Side there, or the East Side. And there's a nine of us here in the room at Panorama, plus a few of our regulars are online also. So welcome to that. We'll get going here. Our clinics are sponsored by the NMRA. Thanks to the NMRA for doing that. You don't have to be an NMRA member, but we sure appreciate all those that you are. We think it's, there's some really advantages by doing that. So think about that when you have an opportunity. We are doing a, uh, this is quite the clinic setup. So we've got the in-house, we've got the room here. We've got the East Side Clinic joining us. And our clinician is from Edmonds, Ron Hopkins. Ron's gonna show our building tips for us. Um, and then probably a little bit of question and answer after that and a little bit of discussion. So without further ado, if Ron's ready, looks like pretty much everybody else has muted their microphones. So if Ron's ready, we'll have you get going, Ron. Okay. There we go. Okay. Everybody set? Um, I like to build uh, structures. My layout, uh, which is 0 and 30, incidentally, and that's important because some of the techniques I use would be different in other scales. Um, it's a small layout, 11 by 14, has 61 buildings so far, 85% scratch. Uh, the remainder of Craftsman Kit or Kit Bashed. And I'm going to describe some techniques and materials I've tried and some things I've learned. Uh, first, a couple screens about my uh, working style. I, uh, I have a pretty nice little workbench, but it is uh, small and it's uh, low, uh, low head clearance because it's under my layout. And um, the main the main things I want to feature here, though, are the glass work surface and uh, the white uh, sheet under it. Um, the glass work surface, if you haven't tried it, is a, is a marvelous thing. It's flat and it's really easy to clean. Uh, when you're done with the project, you just scrape the glue and the paint off and uh, with a razor blade and you're all set for the next project. I have found in the last couple of years that this little roll around cart you know, from uh, some scrap materials I had um, is uh, a really useful adjunct to this work area. And in fact, I do quite a bit of my assembly actually on this uh, little uh, roll around cart, uh, partly because it's lower than my workbench and I can actually lean over it. So that seemed to be handy. Uh, another feature of my working style is that I do quite a bit of planning. I Most every project I plan either with pencil and paper or with uh, two-dimensional CAD. I've not learned three-dimensional CAD. And I used uh, more so in the early days of planning my layout, I used a lot of uh, uh, mock-ups. Um, I mill my own strip wood. Um, and I'm an advocate of that, but it, you have to understand I'm a recovering woodworker, and so I naturally lean in that direction. I also, uh, like Jack Hamilton, I guess, I, I really uh, like elegant tools. Um, and I don't think you, can, you probably can't save a lot of money by cutting your own strip wood, but uh, it is relatively inexpensive. But the main advantage is the inventory problem. When I need a piece of wood, I just go cut it. I don't have to mail order it someplace or something. Um, and uh, I measure carefully. I use the, um, the uh, calipers all the time. I almost never use a scale rule because it's just not accurate enough. Uh, and once I've cut things off, then I'm... Um, sand them to precise dimensions and I have a couple of sanders that I use daily. Um, I also make lots of use of jigs, spacers, and other assembly aids. Um, and uh, I have two adhesives that uh, account for 99% of my 
work. Uh, Aileen's tacky glue is the main one. And for my occasional work with uh, styrene, I use testers, uh, liquid adhesive. Um, I also think that notes and photos are very important. Uh, they do take a certain amount of uh, self-discipline. And uh, so there are occasions when I wish I had written something down that I hadn't. Uh, but nevertheless, I try to have notes and photos. The rest of this uh, clinic will be organized around the elements of a structure, the foundation, core materials, siding, so forth. Um, and at least some of you already know most of this stuff. But I hope uh, that uh, if you can stay awake, I hope you'll get a few ideas about uh, things that you might try or want to do. Uh, <clears throat> I think that buildings look a lot better when they have a foundation under them. And um, uh, the most common foundation I use is just simply a plank of either uh, MDF or masonite painted concrete gray. Um, it just sets the building up a little bit above the the um, scenery and uh, seems to add quite a bit to the scene. Uh, sometimes, uh, as in this case, I've laminated two uh, pieces of MDF to get a thicker platform that uh, looked like concrete uh, and uh, notice uh, the cracks in the concrete and so forth. And sometimes I use timbers, um, only on a couple of projects so far, I think. Uh, I've also tried individual concrete blocks. I cut a bunch of blocks from uh, uh, strip wood. And then uh, this blow up here shows uh, how I uh, spaced out, used uh, thin wood spacers for the horizontal uh, mortar lines. Um, and uh, I painted the assembly gray and um, then uh, mortared with Durham squatter putty. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And uh, this uh, was the uh, final result. And <clears throat> recently I've been planning a uh, annex for an industrial building uh, that I wanted to have a stone foundation. And uh, so I tried this uh, and I think it's gonna work. I just uh, took a piece of plywood for the base, uh, smeared, the uh, uh, exposed edges with uh, a big coating of uh, aliens and then uh, just piled the rocks around and pushed them into the uh, glue. And uh, this was the result. And uh, this is a mock-up of the uh, building that might go over it or the annex that might go over it. And I think it looks promising. Uh, for core materials, uh, my favorite is uh, gator foam. I've been using it for, uh, I don't know, a dozen years, I guess. And uh, it's a, it, for those of you who haven't tried it, it's a foam core, but it's uh, different from the foam core you get at uh, the uh, craft store uh, in the sense that it has uh, wood, 32nd inch wood fiber veneer, both sides, and a very dense foam in the middle. Uh, the result is a 3 16th inch panel that's strong, lightweight, warp resistant, and you can cut it with a knife or a saw. And uh, this is an example of a mock of a building that's under construction using that technique. Uh, incidentally, uh, whoops, excuse me. Incidentally, uh, for windows that are going to be dark, you could just leave the back surface uh, of the uh, veneer in place, scrape out the rest and put the windows in there. And uh, so uh, in this case, I had a building that I was going to have a few windows lighted and some dark. And uh, so I left it inside veneer. I have uh, most recently or more recently uh, started using rabbit joints to uh, uh, connect the corners. A rabbit joint is uh, shown here schematically. Uh, you cut away uh, a portion and uh, <coughs> but uh, but the adjoining uh, side to it uh, it 
then allows by leaving some veneer to cover the foam, uh, it uh, uh, makes a little smoother joint. Uh, this is a technique that I use commonly for measuring things. Instead of uh, measuring with a ruler or even a calipers, I just uh, use the object I'm going to put in the hole I'm making. <laughs> uh, I press it against a, a surface like this uh, angle bar, and uh, then a uh, straight edge is left uh in place without with the uh, measured width of the cut. Uh, make the cut with a scalpel. Uh, by the way, the scalpel I found is a little sharper and lasts longer than uh, exacto number eleven. I've only been using a scalpel for a couple of years, but I'm I'm pretty impressed. Um, I scrape away the upper layer and the foam, and then uh, the result is that the uh, uh, joint uh, looks like this. I reinforce, reinforce all the joints in uh, gator foam with uh, a glue block because uh, even when I've used a rabbit joint, uh, it's still foam against uh, veneer and it's not a very strong joint. <clears throat> Other uh, core materials besides foam core that I've used, of course, are plywood. I've never uh, constructed a building with plywood uh, myself starting from scratch, but uh, many kits come uh, with plywood walls and parts. Uh, styrene, I did have one large project with styrene. Uh, or dimensional lumber, once in a while I want to do something uh, uh, board by board or stick built. Uh, and uh, so I use uh, dimensional lumber. Uh, for small buildings, sometimes just a wood block is a pretty good core. Uh, pump houses like this little thing, uh, just uh, use some uh, strip wood over a wood block. And uh, cardstock, I normally use only for mock ups. I have used cardstock in a couple of uh, applications. Uh, where I just needed an extra wall or something, and, and uh, so I used a piece of cardstock. For those stick built structures, if you incline to do that, uh, these spacers are really helpful. Uh, figure out what size you need in your scale for uh, 16 inch uh, stud separation and um, use that to uh, construct. Uh, the main walls. Uh, incidentally, this tray, uh, Russ Segner mentioned a tray kind of like this in his uh, last clinic, our last uh, East Side clinic session. Um, this is just a little piece of six by six styrene with a, an edge around it. And uh, it's a very square corner and it's useful for all kinds of assembly problems. For siding, I mostly use strip wood, and I always pre-treat pre the strip wood in three steps. First, I apply texture, and these some of the these are some of the instruments I've tried for texture, and then I dirty with alcohol wash. Uh, for most of my models, I have used um, uh, shoe dye and uh, isopropyl alcohol. But recently, I discovered a couple of these uh, hundred line stains. I mean, I don't, I didn't discover them, but I, I got suckered into trying them, and they really are nice. Uh, and uh, so I use the hundred line stains quite often. Uh, but I thin them; they're pretty, pretty dark for my taste. I use a third of the stain and two thirds alcohol. And then <clears throat> the third step is simply to apply color with pan pastels. Uh, most of you by now have probably tried pan pastels, but they're pastel colors in a cake-like format. They're a lot stickier than uh, than uh, pastel chalks, like Bragdon chalks, and uh, they're typically applied with sponges. And uh, this tray uh, actually is large enough to contain. It's a it's a uh, pan pastel product large enough to contain all the colors I normally use. And it's a very handy way to stock, uh, uh, to store the materials because I don't have to take uh, the lids on and off. 
many modelers use pan pastels mainly for weathering and they are terrific uh, for that purpose, but I like them as a main coloration as well as for weathering uh, because they create a worn down appearance that uh, I kind of prefer. Some use clear overspray. I have not found that to be necessary. Uh, Roger Malinowski did a DVD. Roger Malinowski was the owner of Stone Creek Designs in O Scale, and he did a DVD that was very good. He Roger is deceased a couple of years ago, and I don't know whether his DVD is still available or not. Uh, but it is useful if you can find one. So an example from a recent project is uh, uh, I'm going to show you here. I first added the grain and. In this pile of stuff, I used the screwdriver to uh, put in a fairly heavy grain. Uh, and then in this pile, I used a, a, a homemade tool that's uh, five or six exacto number 11 blades uh, glued into a uh, handle uh, with epoxy. And uh, by uh, dragging them backwards across the, the uh, strip wood, you get a fairly... Uh, nice grain, and uh, then uh, they were all stained with a thin two-thirds alcohol. My favorite um, Herner line stain is this Cordovan brown. It's a kind of a, a kind of a black brown, I guess is the way I would describe it. And then I sponge on the color. And in this project, I was using yellow ochre, and uh, you can see there's quite a nice. Uh, a variation from one board to another and then they're just randomly glued on the core and so you know this kind of board to board variation you really can't duplicate with uh, scribed siding uh, and uh, it's close to what i'm after and uh, this shows a slightly later stage after i would added the doors and windows and uh, dusted everything uh, with uh, Pan pastel grays and some raw umber extra dark, which is a, a, a kind of a, again, a black brown or a brown black uh, tone. Uh, and there's a, there is a loading dock that goes with this structure and uh, for the timbers and uh, the planks on, on that loading dock, I used a full strength stain. These are other examples of uh, Using the pan pastels on dirty wood, you know, you can get a variety of effects. Uh, this uh, coal loader, uh, this uh, is an industrial building that masks a uh, interchange uh, track where uh, standard gauge cars come into my layout uh, to transfer loads or to receive loads from uh, my narrow gauge cars. Uh, this is a cannery along the river on my layout. Uh, this this one was a whoops, excuse me. This one uh, was a kit, uh, but I still use the same finishing techniques on the siding. Um, it's a um, a uh, blacksmith shop and a machine shop. Uh, this is a uh, uh, just a, a building, a flat of a building, a retail building uh, behind my station. And uh, this is an open-ended shed. The other side of the shed is is totally open. And they were all done with just uh, the same basic technique. And obviously, not as much applied in this case as in uh, this case. Okay, I've also done uh, clapboard siding with paper. Uh, here I uh, uh, printed some lines uh, on paper of an appropriate uh, width or a separation between the lines. Uh, then I applied uh, pan pastel neutral grays and then red iron oxide pastels, just smeared them on. It doesn't, I didn't want it to be too, too smooth. Uh, then I cut in, cut these strips, and then I, these were self-adhesive paper. Uh, then I laid them out on a background of uh, scribed, um, 
styrene siding, and uh, I had I had previously primed the siding so that uh, the uh, paper would the self adhesive uh, would stick to it a little bit better, um, and uh, the paper uh, the width of the strips I uh, had gauged to be slightly greater than the uh, width of the of the uh, Scribed on the side, scribes on the siding. So I get both a weathered appearance and depth. Um, you can see in these uh, these two photos. And this was the large project those photos are taken from uh, a station based on that in uh, a Northern Pacific station that was in built in Moclips, Washington, in 1906. Uh, and this was another project where instead of using the uh, styrene background, I used uh, gator foam, but uh, applied um, uh, paper to it that had been uh, printed uh, with lines at the uh, appropriate separation. I've also done some wood battens on uh, paper boards. Uh, here I uh, scry uh, painted, or excuse me, printed lines on the paper again at the same, at the uh, uh, separation of, uh, appropriate for bat uh, for uh, planks under battens, and uh, did both the uh, grays and the uh, oxide reds uh, treatment. Uh, Put them on uh, the uh, gator foam backdrop, and uh, this is the uh, result. And these are two other projects that have used the same technique to do uh, board and batten siding. <clears throat> and for bricks, uh, I tried an experiment with uh, brick paper, uh, this uh, shot up here in the corner, and uh, I would just wasn't satisfied with it. It's uh, the paper just lacked so much texture, it wasn't very interesting. Uh, I did find that woodland scenics modular wall panels are okay if they fit your design needs. Of course, you're, there are a limited number of options and how uh, things can be uh, combined. <coughs> but for finishing the bricks, and I do this uh, for all the uh, brick projects, is to uh, spray them with a rattle can. Then uh, these colors here are uh, Krylon brick. This is brick over in this uh, photo. And this photo is uh, Rust-Oleum Claret wine. But, you know, bricks come in a hundred different colors, so whatever you want. Uh, then I apply a slurry of Durham's water putty uh, and I wipe with a dry cloth and then buff with a damp cloth and uh, I'm uh, generally satisfied with the results. Uh, there's also, of course, after the uh, uh, <clears throat> finish, uh, there, there's also been some weathering with uh, rubbing on a few chalks and stuff. But I've also done quite a bit with individual bricks. Uh, this pump house is uh, individual bricks of styrene, and this pump house is indiv individual bricks of wood. Uh, this shows how I put the uh, wood bricks in place, and I use a styrene strip to separate them for uh, horizontal mortar lines. It's a very tedious but satisfying progress. Uh, uh, but the bricks do need to be the same size and uh, it's hard to keep them in alignment. And so it's not very practical for uh, larger projects. I am testing a more efficient method for making my own brick siding. Um, this is to take styrene strips, scribe them at the length of individual bricks and then uh, layer them together uh, with uh, styrene separator strips uh, in between. So in my scale, I use uh, for two by four by eight inch bricks, I use uh, 40 thousandths by 80 thousandths strip styrene scribed at uh, 160 thousandths intervals. And uh, the courses are separated by 10 thousandths styrene. That's slightly narrower than the bricks. This is a jig I made for scribing the vertical mortar lines. It's just two layers of uh, masonite with a uh, separator between that's slightly uh, thicker than uh, 
the uh, styrene, and uh, this shows a side view of how the white is the styrene. It fits between two layers of of uh, masonite uh, with a separator between. I cut the mortar lines with a razor saw, and it's like if you ever want to do this kind of thing, I found that the uh, curve of the uh, thick blade razor saw saw is uh, slightly greater than that of the, and more effective than that of the uh, thin razor saw, thin bladed razor saw. So then I apply the uh, brick strips and horizontal mortar spaces. Uh, in this case, I had prepared a, a little piece of uh, gator foam with a uh, laminated uh, a sheet of um, styrene on that gator foam. And I just did enough to get uh, a piece for demonstration. And then I uh, sprayed it with a rattle can and added the water putty mortar lines. And it looked to me like this uh, had potential. So. I took on a project that I'm still in the midst of, uh, an annex for an industrial building. It's it's not a big project, but it's uh, bigger. It's about, I think, about four inches across the front here and maybe two inches deep. I quickly learned that uh, this is still a tedious process, even very important uh, to keep things aligned. And uh, then after a dozen rows, I began to notice variation in the brick depth, and I've not photographed that very successfully, but you can imagine if you run your finger down this uh, row of bricks, they're not, you can feel the roughness, they're all not sticking out the same amount. Well, I measured five packages of my styrene strips, 10 per package, so that was 50 things that I measured. And the overall variation, they were supposed to be uh, 0.080 inches. And, you know, I thought when I bought 80,000 styrene, it was all 80,000s, but they actually ranged from 68,000s to 88,000s wide. And that's that's a scale inch. So you think about a brick surface that you've seen and imagine the bricks being at the, on the same plane, plus or minus a half inch, that's uh, quite a lot of variation. No package had variation less than 0.077 to 0.084. And so the thickness was much more constant, but it was also a little under 40 thousandths. It was 0.039. Now I've added more to this. I don't show it here, but uh, but the problem persists. So it's, a, it's still up in the air whether uh, paint and mortar will help determine the future utility of this project, of this technique. Uh, now I'd like to talk about roofing a little bit. Uh, I just stumbled on this idea uh, fairly recently, actually, for uh, visible rafter tails. I've always kind of hated putting in rafter tails. Uh, I don't know. It just seems like quite a lot of work. I mean, obviously, you got to have rafter tails, but it just seemed like a lot of work. And I think this jig makes it a lot simpler if I can make clear how I did it. Um, I, I lined up spacers that uh, are at the separation of the rafters on, uh, and then uh, I put them on a, a backing and uh, a base material. Uh, and so the rafter tail slides into these slots. Oh, excuse me. This, this lower uh, backing is pushed against the roof base material. And then the upper uh, spacers and slots hang over the back side, the bottom side of the roof. And so I stick the rafter tails into these slots and uh, they, uh, I get the designated separation. You can see that at work here. Uh, I hope that's reasonably clear because I think it's a useful idea. Uh, going on to the roofing material, I've often used just sandpaper for rolled roofing, uh, cut it in strips, uh, glue it on the subroof and weather it, uh, works pretty well. Uh, one kit I recently was working on, actually you can see uh, familiarity here, um, 
had silk span for the roofing. And so I tried that. Uh, the kit recommended gluing the silk span on with uh, model airplane dope uh, and then uh, coloring it. Instead, I just glued it on with grimy black paint and uh, that part worked fine. But I don't think it had enough texture. It just seemed kind of flat to me. It's okay when it's weathered, but for example, I put a patch here and uh, in most light, you can hardly see that patch. There's just really not very much texture. Uh, silk span, if you've never been a model airplane uh, builder, is uh, very familiar to uh, model airplane enthusiasts. It's the, used to be, anyway, a frequent covering for uh, wings and open uh, other open areas. Uh, <clears throat> I do like uh, masking tape. Uh, here I used uh, just blue masking tape uh, painted with a couple coats of grimy black and uh, then trimmed around the edges with a scalpel. Uh, I had previously stained uh, the under roof so that I could uh, have a few uh, tears and flaws in the roof. Uh, for corrugated roofing, uh, my most used approach is just uh, tape it down, spray it, sponge on some past pastels, uh, pan pastels, and uh, these are some of the rust colors I've used. You can see they range all the way from yellow to uh, pretty dark uh, brown, black. The check marks. I don't expect you to be able to read the names on these colors, but the check marks show that the tones of color that I've used for rust. And then I apply them to a base of uh, plywood or cardstock with uh, transfer tape or aliens. So examples of this method on metal are uh, here. Um, This is actually a uh, red roofing instead of corrugated metal, but it is metal. Uh, and uh, you can see you can get a lot of different effects with this general approach. I also, uh, in fact, in some ways, I prefer the paper, corrugated paper, to uh, uh, corrugated metal. The uh, corrugated paper I use is uh, from Simpson models. I don't know uh, if there are other suppliers or not, but uh, it comes in a roll. And uh, you just cut it into uh, pieces. And uh, here I cut the pieces in advance and um, uh, sprayed them and treated them exactly like uh, the uh, previous example with uh, corrugated metal, but of course, different uh, extensive rust. Uh, another method for corrugated paper is to uh, just randomly slop on uh blobs of uh, roof bound and rust uh, this is done while the paper is still in a in a roll and then you uh cut up the pieces apply them uh and uh wipe off as i did in this roof or don't wipe the, the uh, paint uh, damp or wet paint as i did in this roof and then I glue it randomly to the roof and uh, dust with chalks, as in uh, this roof, or not, as in this roof. And you get quite different effects. And finally, for metal, this is a, a kit I built just a couple of years ago. Um, this is that blacksmith shop uh, that was uh, shown earlier. I sprayed the corrugated metal with gray primer, as usual, but then I put it on the roof with they leans before doing anything else. And then I just use a soft dry brush to drab on, dab on uh, Bragdon chalks. You know, I just made little piles of chalk. And then I sprayed it with alcohol. And when dry, I brushed it lightly with a soft brush. And then I uh, patched up a few sparkles uh, from handling the gray craft paint. I can see now that I missed a few sparkles, but... Uh, I uh, patched them up with craft paint and then uh, touched up with pan pastels. And I think that method has some potential. And this is kind of an aside. It's not really a roof. But if you ever need a really heavily rusted corrugated metal structure, 
uh, I recommend uh, this dark rust that some some author years ago uh, came up with. I don't remember who it was. I'm sorry to say, but uh, one third uh, the focal roof bound color and two thirds rust, and just paint it on, and then touch up with uh, pan pastels. Um, yeah, these uh, the very dark rust is quite appropriate for this wigwam. Uh, burner. Um, there used to be one out on the Olympic Peninsula along Highway 101. I haven't seen one for a long time, but uh, they they were pretty rusty. The heat and <clears throat> combination of heat and weather um, oxidized them pretty badly. Uh, I've also done some tar roofs uh, where I drape ordinary tissue paper Kleenex over uh, the roof base, uh, brush on grimy black uh, kind of smooth out some of the wrinkles, not all of them by any means, with a stiffer brush, and then uh, patch if there are any places that uh, where the paper is torn or anything. Uh, trim and sand the edges and weather and put it in place. Obviously, this is a lot easier if you can do it before you've assembled the building. If you do it after, I've done one when you after you assemble, and then it makes getting anything reasonable around the edges a little harder and stuff but but it can be done these are a couple other examples this is one i did where i put them I, <laughs> whoops sorry here i had assembled the building before i uh, did the roof and uh, this is a, uh, a roof with no no perimeter and so it can be done anyway and it shows a patch Um, and, uh, cedar shingles uh, are the only shingles that I have used in my experience. I, I don't have any experience modeling asphalt shingles. And in my old HO days, uh, rolls of preset craft paper like the Campbell shingles were sort of the standard and were quite effective. More recently, there are a variety of commercial products. I've used just two. Uh, they happen to be in juxtaposition on my layout. Um, this uh, <clears throat> this uh, picture portrays some uh, laser slitted self adhesive craft paper shingles. They come on a on a sheet that looks like this portion photographed here, and they give you a very orderly shingle appearance. You know, straight lines, uh, just not many flaws. Uh, for a more rustic appearance, uh, shake appearance. Uh, on this uh, on this project, I used a uh, laser cut printed heavy paper uh, from Wild West models, and it, it was pretty effective. Um, uh, it's important to distinguish, well, it may be important <laughs> to, sting, to distinguish between shingles and shakes. Uh, shingles are sawn, whereas shakes are split. Uh, so the shakes have more texture and piece-to-piece -piece variation, as you can see in this photograph of single examples, or uh, uh, these are shakes here and these are shingles. In the real world, there are some technical differences in the application of shingles and shakes, uh, the uh, amount of overlap and uh, that sort of thing. But in a modeling scale, the important difference is just that shakes are rougher and more rustic appearance in appearance. And I much prefer the shakes, but I uh, would use shingles for walls because that's usually what is used for walls. <clears throat> I was uh, early on building a shingle mill that needed individual cedar shingles because it was a shingle mill, obviously. Uh, and so I selected some typical prototype dimensions. Uh, these are shown here, 18 inches long for the shingles, widths very randomly, but they're between 12 and three inches. The shingles are nailed in parallel rows with an overlap of 12 inches. So the reveal is six inches, and that's very important. And the angle for the first course is determined uh, by uh, establishing some rows of uh, decreasing width, uh, rows of cedar at decreasing width. And this was the uh, roof of my shingle mill. I cut these, these I actually cut out of a plank, a cedar plank. I cut thin strips of several widths from a cedar plank and then 
chop them into shingles using a Northwest shoreline chopper. And um, I had the chopper set for 18 inch length, but uh, I got quite a lot of variation. Uh, anyway, the overall effect is quite satisfying, but, um, and it's much more like shakes than shingles. So my shingle mill has a shake roof. Um, but uh, chopping the strips uh, was very tedious. Uh, 8,500 uh, shingles on this roof, and it took me almost as long to do the chopping as it did uh, to do the uh, gluing them on. Um, and I felt like it produced exaggerated differences. So I have since been testing a more efficient and precise method of cutting the shingles. I used uh, thin, thin cedar sheets uh, for an old work, woodworking project for this uh, thing. I, I did since then. I recently learned that Sierra West Models has some very nice cedar veneer sheets. They're not large, they're like two and a half by five, but uh, they're very thin and they're uh, nice quality cedar. Anyway, uh, I had this thin cedar on hand and I cut it into strips of four different widths, 12, nine, eight, six, and four and a half inches. I figured that four widths would be enough to give the uh, impression of uh, random widths. And at this stage, when they have this, uh, these uh, strips, some modelers stain these strips in various shades to emphasize individual shingles. I not only view that as extra work and exaggerated, uh, but I don't like the exaggerated color variation. Uh, it kind of creates, in my view, an un unrealistic model appearance. So I did not stain them at this point. Instead, I uh, adhered them to uh, self-adhesive paper and trim the edges. Uh, then I case, uh, cut them uh, into shingle length, uh, again, using a technique I mentioned earlier for measurement. I had a bar gauge that was the length of the shingles I wanted. I pushed it up against a, uh, a uh, surface to uh, adjust the square to the length I wanted, and then I cut them with the scalpel, uh, peeled them off the adhesive strip, this here I'm applying them to this little uh, rough that I was using as a kind of a test. And uh, I put lines on a piece of plywood. And uh, then I, oh, and one thing here that you can't do with strip shingles is with individual shingles, you can make sure that you're covering all the joints. Uh, subsequent layers cover the joints of the, in, of the preceding layer. So they minimize the water leaks. Then I stained this uh, thing with uh, two coats of full strength cordon brown, a uh, hundred line stain, and uh, weathered it with some chalk. And uh, this is uh, the appearance I got. So it's still shake like. There is some variation, but uh, it seems like it's more realistic than I got on my shingle mill. If you wanted to mess with individual shakes, but you didn't, or individual shingles, I'm sorry, but you didn't have the patience putting them on individually, here's another technique that was suggested at a clinic I attended uh, this past fall in Denver. Uh, <coughs> you align the strips on a cutting surface, uh, mixing the widths, and then tape them down at shingle length intervals with narrow strips of uh, masking tape. And if you ever want to do this or anything else with strips of masking tape, this is a useful tool. It's called the Infini Easy Cutting Type A, but it has uh, it's a it's a hard plastic mat with uh, grooves at uh, these spaces, twenty five thousand, thirty thousandths, and forty thousandths of inches, and you can stick masking tape on it and then uh, cut them into strips. Anyway, if you do that and you cut along these. Uh, strip dividers, you you come up with um, individual shingles, but in strips. Uh, so uh, then you apply them like commercial strip products. You don't have to take the tape off, actually. And uh, so you can do a whole bunch of individual shingles in a fairly fast order. Um, and you might you might find that interesting. <clears throat> I had a project uh, many years ago, well, 
a few many years ago, for which uh, accuracy required fabricating double hung windows. And uh, I couldn't get the kind of windows I wanted from uh, <clears throat> commercial suppliers. And I struggled with the approach, but I res it resulted that when I settled on a sash assembly like this, uh, it consists of several layers. Um, in layer one, uh, this bottom layer in this schematic <laughs> is just uh, the outside uh, pieces and the center of uh, the sash uh, structure. Layer two is uh, the upper sash uh, structure. I'm sorry, I forgot to say, I guess you might not know that double hung windows are those where the lower panel, lower sash slides up under the upper sash, in front of the upper sash. Uh, so then I, uh, after I get layer one and layer two in place, then I apply the glazing, uh, the dark lines here, and then uh, layer three finishes in separate pieces, the sash for the lower sash, the sash frame for the lower sash and the frame for the upper sash. So uh, the way I did these with styrene was to uh, assemble in a jig the frame, the trim, uh, the lower sash. Ah. The lower sash and the upper sash. And then I painted them and installed the glazing. I used a PSA, uh, which is pressure sensitive adhesive. It's uh, uh, white when it's applied, dries clear, stays sticky, kind of like a contact cement, and it doesn't squeeze out. So you can uh, put it on with a toothpick or a wire and uh, then apply the glazing and you don't get any squeeze out on the glazing. And then uh, uh, I painted and, and applied pre-painted uh, sash layer three and uh, Muntins. On the glazing, uh, glass side covers look great, but they do date patience and practice, especially effective if you want cracked glass. Uh, this is the end window of a um, uh, speeder house that I uh, built that I uh, Crack, I actually didn't intend this. I cracked this window after I had the building assembled. Uh, but it looks like a cracked glass. And uh, when you try to achieve that with plastic, it's pretty hard. Um, these are the sources uh, that I know about for uh, for uh, glass slide covers, uh, Clover House, Sierra Scale models. And of course, on the internet, there are all kinds of possibilities. And for cutting glass, uh, you measure with calipers, scribe uh, once in each direction with a diamond scribe like uh, like this, uh, a snap of pliers, and then you sweep up the pieces and try again. Um, <laughs> I've uh, gotten lazy and mostly use thin clear plastic, uh, whatever I have on hand, it doesn't seem to make a lot of difference. But uh, I, I do think glass gives a nice reflection and I recommend it if you have the patience. Uh, however, uh, that was those are styrene windows and to obtain the desired finish, I really prefer wood. And I got an idea, it was kind of an epiphany from a kit I had built. The kit windows uh, used laser cut parts in a simple design like this. Uh, <clears throat> laser cut upper and lower sash, upper sash, back part, uh, windows in between these parts and trim on the outside. In the model world, I realized looking at this diagram that glazing could be treated as a structural component. So I could use strip wood in lieu of the laser parts. I figured in losing, if I just use strip wood and glued together this, uh, this piece here, uh, the glue joints are so small, it just wouldn't be strong enough to hold up. But um, if I use the uh, the glazing as a base for that construction, uh, it probably would be plenty strong for a model. 
Um, so instead of mounting glazing on pre-assembled or pre-cut frame, as uh, I normally thought we, I would do, or as in this uh, picture, I mount the frame pieces on pre-cut glazing. Like this, I used a little styrene jig to make an upper sash frame. You can barely see it, but there's the upper sash glazing here, holding these frame pieces together. Uh, then this is the lower sash frame made in the same jig, but it's upside down. I use the PSA glue to glue these uh, sash pieces onto the, to the um, glazing. Then uh, I added the middle moutons uh, and uh, put the window together by uh, gluing the lower sash to the back of the upper sash, uh, making sure that the middle uh, moutons are aligned. Uh, and then I trimmed the rails. Then I added the oversized top and bottom trim and uh, fit the side trim and then cut off the top and bottom access. And uh, this is the result. These windows, uh, this this was a kit, but uh, these uh, uh, attic extensions are uh, add-ons. And so these windows up here are the scratch built ones with that technique I just described. These are the kit windows um, made with uh, pre-cut laser cut parts. A couple of suggestions uh, if you're going to work with this kind of thing. Uh, a pallet from uh, old business cards is kind of useful. Just put a piece of double stick tape on the pallet, uh, stick the um, uh, parts of the sash uh, to that double stick tape, smear the uh, PSA glue on them, and uh, wait for it to dry, and you're ready to go. Um, and I also made this jig for the application of the trim. I found uh, getting the trim, uh, the reveal of the trim uh, consistent across the, the uh, window and um, consistent with what I want it to be, as well as consistent from one part to another, is kind of a tricky task. And so uh, I made this little uh, jig, which is shown here schematically. Uh, X uh, sticks out and determines the, uh, the uh, thickness of the reveal or the width of the reveal. So I slide the um, trim piece under this thing and then put the window over this thing so it butts against the X block here as in this picture. And I get the same reveal all the way around the, the uh, thing. Doors are a lot easier. Uh, using styrene uh, jig, I glue a frame to a door body. I had rails and styles. I used a shim to elevate this uh, a bit above the uh, outside. <coughs> the shim is just, in this case, a piece of cardstock. Um, used that to elevate the uh, the body so far above the the jig, and then I added the trim over the over the jig and trimmed it. And for knobs, uh, I've been using uh, bridal lace pins. I discovered these at Joanne's Fabric. This is a bridal lace pin here. It's forty six thousandths, which is in O scale, about two and a half inches. This is a regular straight pin, which is eighty thousandths and about. Um, four inches. Uh, so the bridal lace pin is a lot better in O scale and it's probably passable in HO, but uh, some of these things don't, don't work very well on smaller scales. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I found it hard to hold the back plate and deal with the back plate. So I developed this way of doing it. I just poke a pin through a paper, uh, trim around the paper with a, a small scissors. So I get a little, little piece of paper for a back plate and then paint it. And in this case, I just dipped it into some brass uh, enamel. And then I uh, drill and insert it in the door and push the uh, back plate uh, down on a dab of, a tiny dab of uh, glue. And uh, I get a pretty good looking door. Now I have a few thoughts about chimneys. Uh, these chimneys were done with individual uh, bricks around a, a uh, wood core, and uh, they're okay, but the, uh, I haven't had very good luck with individual bricks for large chimneys. They're just too hard to keep everything in alignment. 
preferred method for uh, that I like for chimneys is based on a stack of styrene chips. Um, I use um, two scale inch chips, uh, that's 40 thousandths in my scale for uh, the brick courses. And uh, then I use a mortar spacer, spacer uh, of a half inch, which is 10 thousandths in O scale and uh, scribe vertical. So the, the horizontal mortar lines are provided by the spacer and the vertical mortar lines are scribed in place. And I start then with a bunch of chips like uh, this and uh, scribe them uh, by, in the, in the first, when I first used this technique, I scribed them by just holding on a pair of pliers you do have to hold them securely and not with your fingers. Uh, and uh, pressing with a number 11 blade. And I did the spacing by eye, and this was the result. Uh, this is a, a prototype photo of the chimney I was trying to replicate. And this is the model uh, that I produced for um, my station. These are two large chimneys on a um, Kiln, they're a shingle driving kiln on my shingle mill, drying kiln on my shingle mill, and uh, they uh, they were made with this uh, same technique. Uh, I improved those procedures on a more recent project. I used uh, plywood blocks to make sure uh, for measuring to make sure that uh, uh, I got consistent uh, sheets from which I cut uh, styrene strips. And then I made a cutting guide uh, for the uh, mortar lines and uh, clamped them uh, like you see here and uh, scribed through those cutting lines with a razor saw. Uh, this uh, method leaves a residue on the backside. You just scrape it with a number 11 blade and then you have to be careful. In this case, I had uh, three uh, course, uh, courses along one dimension of the chimney and um, one, two, three, four, five, six full length along the other side. You have to make sure that you're alternating which um, which um, scribes are lined up. So I'm going back now to this diagram. You know, you want to make sure that the uh, the uh, vertical mortar lines alternate like this. Um, and so I'm here stacking them carefully inside a little bit of a, this is a, a thick bladed uh, square that's handle for, handy for um, this kind of glue up thing and uh, gluing them together here, more progress. Um, so then I got a stack like this. I didn't need scribes on some of the uh, uh, brick courses because they were gonna be up against a wall. Um, and then I sprayed it with all with claret wine and uh, mortared with the water putty that I have used before. And uh, this is the result. Uh, fairly large chimney, looks pretty good. Uh, went together eh, reasonably quickly. Um, <clears throat> a lot of projects have ladders. And so I made a jig. Uh, this allows me to, I, do, I made this jig specifically for two by four reels and styles. Um, it has holes in it to make it uh, possible to push the jig out from the back side. I push the uh, ladder out from the back side so that I don't tear up my work as I'm prying it out of the jig. Um, and so here uh, I'm putting in a few uh, uh, stairs, steps on the jig, on the uh, ladder. Uh, they don't have to be cut very precisely. Uh, here I finished it. Pop, I'm popped in and out of the jig. Uh, this is the result. And so then I just uh, turn over and trim the edges. And I can make ladders of any length. Uh, excuse me. I can make ladders of any length by just sliding this piece up, you know, uh, in, in the jig. And uh, so uh, here are a couple of uh, engine, engine servicing facilities, uh, one with a very long ladder and then uh, another with a couple of ladders. Uh, more ladders here and here, all done with that uh, that jig. And just a couple words about lighting. Um, I have uh, 
previously used incandescent lighting for most of my projects over the years. But, uh, well, for example, this engine house was one I did early on the <coughs> on the 20 year history of my current layout and uh, still using incandescent at that time. These were some uh, miniature incandescent bulbs I bought uh, from a place in Minneapolis for a ridiculously uh, low price 30 or 40 years ago, you know, a whole bundle of 50 or 100 of them for seven or eight dollars. Uh, and Campbell uh, lampshades, which I uh, hoarded. Uh, this is the inside of my engine house, um, and it's it's lighted in that way. Uh, more recently, I've been pleased with the Woodland Scenics just plug system. Uh, seems to work pretty well, and it's it's convenient. Uh, allows you to control the intensity. Also, uh, this night scene uh, illustrates both. Uh, these buildings in the background are all lighted with incandescents. The uh, street lights and the lighting of the station are uh, both uh, from Woodland Scenics products. I don't sell Woodland Scenics products, by the way. <laughs> Recently, I've used uh, pre-wired uh, service mount LEDs, and uh, they are really nice. Uh, they're tiny, absolutely tiny. You can hardly see one in a photograph here at the end of the wires. Um, they take a 12-volt power supply. Uh, the number I've used is 0402. You can buy them anywhere on the internet. Most of them come from China, I think. Um, uh, and, oh, you need to get them wired because otherwise you're going to be soldering wires to this little tiny thing. Um, and, yeah, I use a current limiter on the advice of a clinic I attended by uh, Sam Swanson years ago um, that uh, instead of uh, trying to figure out which size resistor to use, uh, just use the current limiter to make sure the current doesn't exceed the 20 mils that uh, LEDs can take. I did need to add a 10K series resistor for dimming. Uh, and then again, I'm still using uh, Campbell brush lamp shades. The main hint in this slide is uh, in this trick here, uh, which also came from Sam Swanson, but uh, soldering these uh, fine gauge wires, you know, they're only 35 gauge or so uh, wires and soldering them to each other is very, very unpleasant if not impossible. Uh, so I use, made basically made terminal strips uh, with uh, bits of uh, uh, clad uh, PC board. Uh, and these, these bits are from old ties I had, or tie bits I had left from um, Fast Track's uh, tie assembly. But, uh, you know, once you've got these things in place, then soldering these little wires is trivial. You just put on a pool of solder and stick the wire in it. Can't make a mistake. And I think that's the end. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> Thank you, Ron. If you can, uh, everybody that wants to ask a question, open up your microphone and See what we have for Ron. Thanks for sharing, Ron. Ah, uh, you're welcome. My pleasure. So, Ron, I had a question. Where do you get your gator foam? Oh, I buy it from Micromark. Uh, you can probably get it cheaper from uh, uh, one of the art supply houses, uh, but Micromark comes in convenient. 18 by 24 sheets or something like that. And uh, I don't use it enough that the the uh, inconvenience of buying a four by eight sheet uh, from, uh, let's see, what do I want to say? That um, the big mail order art supply house. Anyway, uh, I buy it at Mike Mark. You can also buy it uh, directly from Gatorboard. At where? Directly from Gatorboard. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and there probably are other sources too. I haven't really looked very far for it. I tried it on Micromark and got what I wanted. And so I've used it. Anybody else with questions? Yeah, guys. 
Yeah, so uh, go ahead, Ryan. I'll repeat it if they don't hear it. Uh, you talked a lot through there about trimming off your ends on particular things, the blue tape, uh, the ends of the ladders, the ends of shingles and stuff. What are you using to get a nice – what's your technique and tool for getting a nice, crisp uh, cut rather than fraying it out or uh, – or breaking, breaking your joints. So the question was, how do you get the nice clean joints when you're cutting off the edges? Oh, uh, uh, probably a straight edge razor blade is the best bet. Uh, just press down with a straight edge razor blade. If you're not, if the stock you're cutting is not thicker than uh, uh, oh, 40 or 50 thousandths, uh, you have to push hard, but you can cut it with a razor blade, and that's probably the best way to do it. Okay, other questions? Well, I have a comment on horizontal siding. Uh, a lot of times you see these sort of uh, laid on the side of the building in random length, but they're typically always going to be uh, ended on a uh, vertical uh, structure, your uh, yeah. siding, and that's usually, you know, going to be either 12, 16, or 20, 24 inches. And those should line up, even though they're yeah. not necessarily, they won't be adjoining, but just keep in mind that a totally random siding well, uh, is not going to look right. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Russ, and I do try to pay attention to that. Uh, I didn't mention it uh, because uh, I didn't want to complicate it too much, but um, I, do, I do try to pay attention to that. I do not use very many nail holes. It just seems to me that uh, scale size nail holes would be so small they're invisible anyway, and uh, I haven't had very good luck with uh, the various means I've tried for making nail holes. So I basically don't do that, but but yeah, I try to respect the 16 inch or in relatively few cases, 24 inch spacing of uh, the planks. Yeah, your structures are just gorgeous. And obviously you pay a lot of attention to the detail as tedious as all get out. Thank you. Thank you. I, I should say that I'm, I'm not really into the uh, excruciating detail of diorama artists. I like to have enough detail so that it looks like plausible reality. And so uh, a neighbor next door who's not really into this kind of stuff can still say, yeah, that looks pretty real. <laughs> yes, another question here in the room. Go ahead. Have you tried anything with log cabins or, or like Selvin style siding or anything like that? Uh, I didn't understand the question. Question was, have you tried anything to make a log cabin style? Oh, no, I have not. Uh, that's an interesting idea. And there are, I can imagine uh, that would be kind of challenging, but I haven't tried it. All right. You use a lot of blue tape. You don't, and the idea behind blue tape is it's easier to get off, but you're not having problems with it coming loose over time. No, I'm not. Um, uh, I've never had any problem with that. And, uh, no, uh, the, the, um, uh, the engine, the coaling tower that, uh, has the blue tape roof is, uh, has been in place for, Six or eight years, I think, and okay. uh, no problem. Thanks. Other questions? Well, thank you, Ron. Excellent presentation. You have, you have some beautiful buildings. Um, I've seen the one down at Moclips. That's a beautiful build, building, and all yours are. Thank you for joining us uh, for the Olympia Clinic and the Eastside Clinic. We'll be back again on December 15th. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation on how my outdoor railroad came along this year and the uh, fact that we were able to run 10 operating sessions, and I have some pictures of that, and it'll, it'll be a nice, warm, sunny day.